Okay, without any further ado. Um, I've known the Rav since I moved to the neighborhood and um, been very impressed. Uh, besides the fact that he gives the Daf Yomi in English, also in Hebrew at the Shtiblach and, and the English at the Shir Hadash. And I don't know what, what he saw in me, but whenever he wasn't able to give the Shir, he asked me to give it, which was uh, to the Rav. Uh, so he, outstanding, okay, in terms of personality and character, I don't even have to go into, but uh, he is the great grand nephew of Rav Cook, and tonight's uh, concept, let's make Israel great again, or make Israel great again, based on teachings of Rav Cook. So being the grand, great grand nephew, but that's not all he does. He's also um, working and one of the researchers at the research for halacha and uh, the halacha berura, based on the um, teachings and vision of Rav Cook. So I think uh, to hear what he has to say is not only authentic, but uh, very apropos for this time of year. So without any further ado, Rav Kidron. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, actually, when Rabbi Postman asked me to speak tonight, he told me that there's a series of shiurim uh, about tshuva, tshuva, chodesh elul, before Rosh Hashanah. So Rav Kook, in his, uh, he wrote a book about tshuva, Orota Tshuva, and in his book he speaks about the concept of not just tshuva for the individual, but actually the entire world is in the process of tshuva from the time of the sin of Adam. Adam. <coughs> the purpose of the world is to return, to get back to that high level that Adam was on when he was created. And specifically, we, the Jewish nation, have to do not just the tshuva of every individual, but tshuva of the nation. And uh, I found, I think, that uh, if we look at uh, Herzl, Herzl, who uh, was the uh, visionary of the state of Israel, he's recognized <coughs> as the visionary of the state of Israel, I think in him we can find the roots of the tshuva that uh, we as a nation and, and the state of Israel can and should and will do. What uh, puzzled me about Herzl was uh, I found some kind of a contradiction within him. <clears throat> On one side, you can see here, it says, uh, there is a quote of what he said just before he died. He died at a very young age. And it says that uh, he was diagnosed with a heart issue uh, a day before his death. One day before his death, he told Reverend uh, William Heckler, whoever, I'm not sure who he was, says, greet Palestine for me. I gave my heart's blood for my people. And Herzl indeed was, uh, he devoted the, his last years. He, uh, he did, he gave everything he had. He did everything for the Jewish people, for the, uh, to have a Jewish state. That was his dream, that was his vision. And he sacrificed everything he had for that. On the other side, in his personal life, uh, his relationship with Judaism was not that, uh, that great. For example, he, uh, he had one son, and he refused to circumcise that one son he had. If nowadays you, we, we look at the, at the Jews now in, in Israel, it's close to 100% of Jews that circumcise their son. Those who do not do it are uh, considered uh, very extremists. So um, how come such a person, if, if, that, if he did it on purpose, that he didn't circumcise his son, so he was a very extremely anti-religious, as we would say today, so what made him care so much for the Jewish people? I found it some uh, puzzling. What, what's, uh, what's going on here in, in his uh, personality? Also, he had, uh, apparently he had... Uh, uh, another idea. What bothered him mainly was anti-Semitism. <clears throat> That's what bothered Herzl. So uh, he had an idea. In his diary, it says that there's a quote here from his diary. 
And it says, he says, about two years ago, I wanted to solve the question of the Jews with the help of no less than the Catholic Church. And what was his idea? I wanted to assure myself, firstly, the help of the princes of the church in Austria, and to obtain through them an interview with the Pope. <clears throat> and he wanted to say to the Pope, help us against the anti-Semites. And I am creating a great movement among the Jews who will pass freely and nicely to Christianity. And that, that's what he thought. I mean, you, you can expect that from a person who doesn't care about Judaism, so uh, what's wrong about uh, becoming Christians and solve the problem? Uh, get rid of Judaism and uh, you have no anti-Semitism. That's what he thought. And he even described in his diary what was his dream, how, how, what will be the ceremony of the Jews that will all march together to, uh, to the church and uh, proudly will say, we are now converting to Christianity and thus uh, solve all the problems of the Jews in the world. That was his dream. So if that was his uh, knowledge of Judaism, which is basically zero, so why would he care about so much about the Jewish people and de devote and sacrifice his life for them? That's an... I couldn't understand this. So we'll get to the answer, but before that, <coughs> I would like to present the vision of Rav Kook, which came to complete Herzl's vision for the state of Israel. Herzl's vision was eventually he realized that uh, converting to Christianity is not the solution. So uh, he promoted the, the, the Zionist Congress and he, uh, and he promoted the idea of having a state for the Jews. But his motivation, his only motivation was anti-Semitism. That was his problem. He wanted to solve the problem of anti-Semitism to have one state at least on earth where Jews can live proudly without being bothered by uh, anti-Semitism. Agav Kook uh, wrote a paragraph in uh, one of his books, Orot, and I think that this paragraph actually is talking to Herzl. It might have been written after Herzl's death, but it, uh, he's responding to Herzl's dream. And he says, I'll say in Hebrew and English, Eina Medina he says, just to have a state, that alone, is not the supreme happiness of man. And we have to understand that this Rav Kook wrote this decades before the state of Israel was established, at a time that Jews could only dream about having a state. We were all scattered all over the, the world in the diaspora and in the exile. And uh, they spoke, of course, about the Zionist, move Zionist movement uh, started then. But uh, already then, Rav Kook realized that the dream of Herzl to have a state is a great dream. But it's not enough. It might be the first level. But the, it's not the ultimate goal of us as a Jewish people. To have a state alone is good, but it's not the highest level of happiness for the Jewish people. He says, this can be said about a standard state, which is not much more than a big responsibility establishment. Where he says in uh, Hebrew, a regular state is no more than chevrat achrayut gdola. And I, when I read this, I thought actually that if we look at the states we have nowadays all over the world, is there any positive, anything positive in the purpose of any state? As far as I know, all states, the purpose of every state is to... I mean, why do people have a state? What's the purpose of having a state? The purpose is to avoid negative. To avoid negative, to let people... If you say that the purpose of the state is to let people live freely and happily and uh, be, uh, do whatever they want, that means you want them to avoid coercion, to avoid uh, violence, to avoid uh, negative things. So. Obviously, to avoid that, you have to have a state, to have police, to have an army, to have an order, to have something that will prevent chaos. That's the purpose of a state. But uh, there is no other state with a positive goal, something to strive for, besides letting people live and do whatever they want. 
So he says, regular states, that's for purpose to avoid the negative. But he says, Masha'enken, it's not so. Medina, she be soda ideal, the state which is fundamentally idealistic, as the Jewish state should be. Shechakuk be'avayata hatochen ha'idiali ha'yotev elyon. Well, it speaks in a high language of even in Hebrew. It's not so simple to understand. But anyway, he says that the state of Israel is not just a regular state. It's not, not just any state. The purpose of the state of Israel is not just to avoid the negative. The bottom line: the purpose of the state of Israel is to be Hashem Echad, one God and one name, which is truly the highest happiness. That's of Cook's vision, as a, which comes to complete Herzl's vision for the, te- the state of Israel. Not just so. So I think we, if we can, want to summarize so far, we can say that Herzl's vision for the state was: we need a state in order to avoid negative, to avoid anti-Semitism, to let the Jews live freely and happily without any uh, disturbances. Rav Kook is saying, <coughs> that's good, but it's not enough. We need to have a state for a positive purpose, <coughs> to do uh, Kiddush Hashem, to sanctify God's name in the world. And now the question is, how exactly, or first of all, what's the source? What is Rav Kook's source that that's the purpose of the Jewish state? Everything Rav Kook wrote in his books has a source. He did not invent anything from his own. I mean, he analyzed the sources and, of course, got to uh, uh, contemporary con- conclusions. But what's his source? And what's the, uh, uh, what exactly does it mean to have a, such a positive state? So I think that the source is actually was said by Hashem just before he ca- came to give us the Torah. When Hashem came to give us the Torah, the last statement he says to Moshe Rabbeinu was that I'm giving you the Torah, and then he says, "Ve'atem to you, li, you shall be for me, mamlechet koanim, the goy kadosh, a kingdom of servants." Koanim here means the servants, not the priests. The goy kadosh and a holy nation. So it sounds like this is the purpose of the Torah. The Torah was given not not just for individuals to keep the mitzvot as an individual, but uh, the purpose is to have a, an entire state, an entire nation that keeps the Torah as a nation, and not just as individuals. And I think that has to do with this uh, process I mentioned in the beginning, but the re- tshuva, the repentance of not just the individual, but of a nation, of a state, which also can repent and get back to the track it should go to. And uh, Sforno, for example, explains that Mamlechet Kohanim Vegoi Kadosh, a kingdom of servants and a holy nation, <coughs> means that uh, this uh, Jewish state should instruct all mankind to call all of them in the name of the Lord and to serve Him as one, as Israel will be in the future. So uh, that should be the purpose of the Jewish state. Now, to understand it a little bit better, I think another concept of Kuk writes is that everything we find in an individual, we also find in the cloud, in the, in the nation. An individual person has a soul, so too he says, the nation, the Jewish nation has a soul. There's the soul of the Jewish nation. And everything that happens to an individual could happen to the, to the nation as a whole, as a nation. So uh, in order to understand what exactly it means to, have, to be a holy nation, so we should first understand what does it mean to be a holy individual. What is this term holiness, which is not so frequently used nowadays in uh, common usage, but uh, what, what exactly does it mean to be a holy person? The Torah mentions it a few times in Parashat Kedoshim, Kedoshim to you, you should be holy. What exactly does it mean? So, I think that this uh, concept, this concept of being a holy person and, and truly a holy nation, is the Torah's solution for the most fundamental 
the most fundamental philosophical problem that mankind ever encountered. Every, all religions tried to solve this problem, and none of them were successful so far. And the Torah gives us the solution for this most basic fundamental problem. The problem is what uh, here we have a quote from Orachaim that describes this uh, problem. He says, You should know. <coughs> that materialism will oppose the spiritual connection more than the resistance between fire and water. This is the most fundamental problem of mankind which most people do not even realize that exists. But this is the problem. What's the problem? The problem is that every person has two parts within him. There's the material, the physical part and the spiritual part, the body and the soul. The problem is that each one of these parts wants something opposite than the other. The soul, uh, <clears throat> I, I, later I have a quote from a, a commentary to Sefer Azor, a Sulam. He explains that the, the will of the body is to receive for itself. The body desires to receive. When a, when a baby is born, the baby, all it knows is just to receive. The baby needs to eat, needs to be dressed, needs warmth. It does not yet give anything to anyone else, uh, knowingly. As a person grows up, so then he gets a soul, and this, the soul wants to give. And that's the, the opposite problem here, that the body wants to receive. The soul wants to give, and each one despises the other. The soul does not enjoy receiving materialistic things. The soul despises it. The body does not enjoy giving materialistic things. The body despises it. So how can a person get along with these two contradicting forces that exist within him? And if we actually were able to, uh, to look at the person's life in slow motion, we were able to see that it's actually ev each and every small act, each and every small thing a person does. And I talk about just I talk about significant things, not the mundane things that you pass by. But anything significant is either either gives pleasure to the soul or gives pleasure pleasure to the body, but it can't be both. I mean, there could be a combination of both, but, uh, but there's the dominant thing could be either the soul or the body. For example, I'll tell you a story about... Uh, I have a second cousin of mine who has a very amazing organization. He, te he teaches uh, Israeli students about uh, Zionism and Judaism, the secular students that know nothing about it. So he told me he went, he went once to uh, South America to... Uh, a house of a wealthy person, and that person uh, gave his organization, donated to his organization, gave him a check, eighteen thousand dollars. So uh, he told him, uh, "Thank you." So he says, "You thank me, you know, you know what a pleasure I have to give you this check." He, he showed him in his uh, bookshelf. He says, "You see, I have a Agadash al Pesach with the very nice Agadah." He says, "You know how much I paid for this? For this, I paid double this amount." And he says, when I bought this agada, I was happy about it. But uh, but now when I give you this check, I know that it goes for the right purpose. I'm so happy, you can't imagine. Now this happiness of giving something, this pleasure a person has when he gives something, when he knows it goes to the right purpose, this is not a pleasure of the body. It's a pleasure of the soul. The soul feels happy to do its task in the world, to do the purpose, the right thing, to give what he has to do. Other pleasures are pleasures of the body. So uh, the body does not want to give. The body, if you ask the body, the body wants more money to keep for himself and to have uh, physical pleasures. So uh, there are two contradicting forces within a person. All the religions of the world tried to overcome this problem, but they couldn't. For example, Christianity, how come Catholic uh, priests do not get married? Why do they have this prohibition? Because they wanted to solve this problem. How can you have the physical 
thing and the spiritual thing, physical leads you to one side, the spiritual to the other side. So they said, okay, let's just avoid physicality. But uh, we all know what they do in, uh, in their private rooms. So uh, that's not the solution. How come uh, Muslims do not drink wine? There's a prohibition in Islam to drink wine. Why is that so? Because they saw that wine is something too physical for them, so uh, they said, let's avoid it. But it's not the solution. The solution is not to avoid physicality. The solution is what the Torah says. And the Torah gives us the solution, and that's what's called holiness. And to understand this more precisely, let's see what the... Uh, I mean, the Ramban here just actually explains the problem, which I just uh, said now. Uh, basically, what the Ramban says is that without this mitzvah, without this commandment of the Torah to be holy, a person could technically fulfill all the commandments of the Torah. A person could be, could appear like a ultra-Orthodox person, and yet be a villain. Naval Gershut Torah. Because it says, even though the Torah gave us some guidelines of what is it that a person should do, what are the things that a person is supposed to refrain from, the Torah gave us this mitzvot. But it's not just about that. So a person could fulfill all the mitzvot of the Torah, could refrain from all the prohibitions the Torah prohibits, and yet be completely physical. I can tell you a, a story about uh, just now. My, my wife is dealing with the family law. So she has a case right now of a couple that lived in Bnei Brak, and the, uh, the husband uh, appeared like a Haredi person. He's like a ultra ultra orthodox. But uh, the wife knows that he's not, he's not so. Actually, he's a real villain that this, in this story. He's, uh, he goes out, goes, goes uh, with the women, with men, whatever, goes uh, to Chutzlar and says whatever he wants. But then now this couple came to the rabbinical court, and uh, the husband appeared la- there like with the tzitzit, with a suit, like a Haredi person. So she says, the, the wife uh, said to the Dayanim, the judges, it's the first time I see him with the tzitzit. He never wore this uh, at home. He appeared, appeared like a Haredi person outside, but <clears throat> inside he's an he's a, he's a evil person, he's a wicked person. So a person could actually keep all the laws of the Torah and still be wicked. <clears throat> How come? Because uh, the Torah does not prohibit you to eat kosher food, does not prohibit you to marry many wives as you want. So you could uh, do all, in, indulge yourself in all physical pleasures, and, uh, and officially that appears to be okay. That's why the Torah gave us the mitzvah of Kedoshim to you, that a person should know. Without this mitzvah, all the rest of the mitzvahs are just technical guidelines which are not, uh, do not really influence the person. So uh, the way to practice it is as, for example, the tool says here, he says that the purpose, that uh, what the way of per- a, a Jew should live is, ultimately, anything one enjoys in this world, one should not have the intention for his own pleasure, rather to uh, the service of his creator. That's the thing. Not to avoid physical pleasures, but when you take anything physical from the world, you should take it because your body needs it, but you should have the intention for the sake of the service of your Creator. And this is the solution for this, uh, for this uh, contradiction between the two contradicting forces within the person, because as we'll see just now, the soul wants to give. The body wants to receive. So if you receive and give, you live in a contradiction. You can, you, you can, if a person wants to be consistent, it's impossible. But if, when you receive, you receive in order to give, so as we'll soon see, that reception is considered an act of giving. And, and if you do it completely, so then all your life you're consistent, you're just giving. When you take something physical, from this world, if you have the right intention when you take it, the right intention that you take it for the service of your Creator, you're not really receiving, you're actually giving. 
And uh, of course, when you, your soul gives, you also give him. So that, that's the solution. Another uh, thing about this is that when the body wants to receive, so that receiving is being passive. When the soul wants to give, giving means that you're active. And, and that's a big difference. <clears throat> you can't always tell the difference. But uh, many, many uh, parents are worried when their children are uh, sitting uh, too long and uh, watching uh, TV. I'm not sure, maybe nowadays it's not just TV. It's, uh, there's computers, there's other things. But uh, the problem that they say is that they sit too much and they're passive. They're too passive. But I think if we look deeper into it, it's not just the fact that they sit that's being passive. A person could be sitting and be very active. Hawking can demonstrate, right? Hawking, Stephen Hawking. He sits all the time, but he's pretty active, no? Might be too active for some, some things. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but the fact that a person sits does not necess- necessarily indicate that he is passive. Being passive or active is something within your soul. And uh, it's, it's all about giving or receiving. So if you sit in the study Torah, for example, you're actually active. You're not passive. If you sit and watch a movie, and most of the movie, most of culture nowadays is, is uh, for the pleasure of the body, if, you, if your intention is to receive pleasure for your body, so then you're passive, you're indeed passive. So, uh, so that makes a big difference. So to, to understand this, let's see the introduction to a sulam commentary. He says as follows, that haguf, the body is the will to receive for itself. He says, Through the engagement in the performance of mitzvot, from Bal Mitzvah, but Mitzvah and above, which a person performs, a person performs the mitzvot in order to bestow gratification to his creator. By doing that, a person starts to purify the will to receive for himself, which is imprinted in him, and slowly, slowly, turns it into a will to bestow. Actually, this book, Sefer Asulam, says that that's the purpose of every person in life. It says the, pur- the purpose of every person in his private life is to turn this will. A person is born with the will to receive, the body wants to receive, and the purpose of the person in life is to turn over that will from will to receive to will to give. To let the soul drive the body with the will to give, instead of the body driving the soul with the will to receive. And he says the will to receive for oneself will be entirely a receiver in order to bestow gratification to his creator. If that's what a person does, is careful about that. That any physical pleasure a person derives is done with this right intention. That I don't take this pleasure for myself. I take it because I need it for the service of my creator. So if one does that, so then he actually does not receive anything. Everything he does is giving, because any pleasure he receives is not received for his own physical pleasure. He receives it for the purpose of enabling himself to give more later to to the service of his creator. And he says, because reception, in order to bestow, is considered a pure bestowal. That's the novelty of Judaism. That's the meaning of the mitzvah, Kedushim you. If a person lives his life that way, so then that's a holy person, that's a consistent person who all, what he does all his life is just give and give and give and everything he takes is also actually an act of giving because he, he takes it in order to give. And then he says, and all the service of Torah and Mitzvot that was given to the entire world during the 6,000 years of its existence and to every individual in the 70 years of his life is only to bring them to this perfection. That's the purpose of life of a Jew. And um, I think that just as this is the purpose of a Jew as an individual, 
so too this should be the purpose of the Jewish nation as a nation. <coughs> now, if we go back to Herzl, uh, Herzl himself, I, I think he, he basically repented, he did tshuva. He changed his approach completely, 180 degrees. He changed his, uh, his view. If initially he was uh, what we would call today anti-religious, or he refused to circumcise his son, he refused to, uh, he wanted all Jews to convert to Christianity, <coughs> Eventually, he changed his mind, <coughs> and actually he himself explained that that uh, idea to convert everybody to Christianity was not really a real idea. It was maybe just uh, something he imagined. He says in his diary also, at first, the Jewish question hit me very yeah. much. Perhaps, he says, perhaps there was a time when I found, when I would have uh, evaded it willingly, perhaps to Christianity, anywhere. In any event, he says, these were vague tendencies of youthful weakness. So he himself says, it wasn't a real idea, it was just uh, out of the weakness of a, of a youth, because I tell myself, with all my sincerity, <coughs> I never really intended to convert or change my name. <coughs> and he himself was actually very proud of being a Jew all his life. So uh, that idea was something uh, unclear, but it was not really his thing. Later he realized that the solution to convert to Christianity is not going to solve the problem of anti-Semitism. So uh, he realized that the solution must be to have a Jewish state. And then he also wrote, uh, Our nation is not a nation but in its faith. What could be better than this? He's uh, saying himself that the Jewish faith is the main thing of the Jewish people. So you can't uh, convert to any, anything else. And then... Um, Eventually, what can, I think, demonstrate more than all Herzl's Jewish soul is uh, what he wrote also in his uh, diary. And this was uh, during the Jewish, the Zionist Congress. Uh, it says, out of respect to the religion, on the Shabbat before the Congress, I went to the synagogue. He went to the synagogue. The head of the community called me to come to the Torah. Since Herzl was not uh, raised uh, Orthodox, so obviously he, couldn't, he didn't know uh, how to recite the blessing, but it seemed like he was told in advance he was going to, call to the, he was going to be called to the Torah. So he says, I asked Malchus Memran, the brother-in-law of my friend from Paris, to teach me to recite the blessing. And when I went to the Bima, I was more excited than in all the days of the Congress. And he says, the few words of the Hebrew blessing choked my throat with more excitement than the opening speech and the closing speech and all the deliberation. So this, I think, shows his, uh, his deep uh, soul, Jewish soul, that uh, ultimately repented and realized that the solution is not to uh, run away from Judaism, the opposite, the solution is to go back to Judaism. <coughs> and if we go back to the Jewish state as a state, or to the Jewish nation as a nation, <coughs> I hear, I heard the Netanyahu, the Prime Minister, <coughs> speaking many times about the uh, great achievement of the State of Israel. And indeed, I think Herzl's dream is now fulfilled. We have an amazing state in 70 years. The state of Israel is in the forefront of, of many things. The first in the world in many, many things. And in many other things, it's, uh, if it's not the first, it's, in, it's among the, uh, the, uh, the, the forefront. In the high tech, agriculture, water, you name it, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing state. Nobody could dream that we'll have such a state within such a short time. But everything I hear that Netanyahu is speaking about is is still Herzl's dream to <coughs> avoid anti-Semitism, to uh, be able to protect ourselves, to avoid violence, to have the physical conditions right for the Jewish people, to have proper economy. But I do not yet hear anything about something positive. Everything Netanyahu speaks about is to avoid the negative, if you, if you look at it carefully. To avoid the negative, to avoid enemies, to avoid war, to avoid violence, to live uh, freely. It's great, it's all great, but it's not yet 
the ultimate vision of a Rav Kook. And uh, for example, if the Jewish state is a superpower in uh, in uh, in uh, high tech, in agriculture, in all these areas, I think the Rav Kook's dream will be fulfilled when the Jewish state will be a superpower in culture in uh, showing the world what is the right way to live as a, as a holy person. I mean, today's culture, for example, is uh, mostly, if you look at the, at the movie or at, the, at the, whatever it is, a show, a song, so they all mostly speak about the physical, the physical uh, pleasure for the physical body. Not too many speak about the spiritual soul the pleasure for the soul. So uh, if we will be able to uh, promote that, and it all starts from individual. Every individual is a small uh, screw in the big machine, and every screw that is more well uh, tightened, that strengthens the entire machine. So when every individual becomes better himself, becomes uh, more consistent himself, so that helps the entire Jewish nation as a nation, and with Lat Hashem we will be sooner a light to the nation and that's a repentance of the Jewish people and there's not a shame the full redemption will see soon I have a question sure <laughs> um, more of a comment I, you know when you were, when the rub was talking and uh, I just remember what Rabinov Weinberg always told us he told us that we, we learn we should learn in order to teach and he wanted to back it up. Obviously, he's into outreach and Kiruv, but he says, what is the Rambam? And not just the Rambam, anybody who tells you what's the source for the mitzvah to learn. Learn to, learning seems to be, a pa not passive, but absorbing, right? So if you're learning to teach, it means you're learning in order to give it over. So the source the Rambam brings down for learning is Vishinantam of You should teach. To do it right, to learn correctly, is to learn in order to, in order to teach. So uh, I always thought, well, if you're going to learn in order to teach, you can pay more attention, because how can you tell it over if you don't know it? It could be a practical thing, but I think it's really what the Rebbe is saying now, that if you do any mitzvahs, right, because uh, even if it's not l'shema, hopefully it will become l'shema. Perhaps that's just an dugma, that's just an example of one mitzvah. They apply to every mitzvah. Do it, even if it's selfish. But ultimately, it's for the for the good, right? The weather should. Well, uh, I, I would like to suggest that uh, in a little more positive way that although uh, we, our state, uh, is not yet uh, fulfilling um, uh, Ralph Cook's dreams, we're on the way. And in this way, in this respect, as, as you said. The will to receive is the will to give. And I think that this uh, nation is now becoming recognized as a nation of gifts. We, when there's a, 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 a disaster in the world, we are there. We are the first there. We are in Africa doing amazing things to improve the lot of the poor African nation. I've just given you a couple of examples. I, but uh, we, we, as you said, we're changing and, and, and improve the agriculture all over the world. We are giving. Baruch Hashem, great. Yeah, that's great. But uh, I think uh, so far we are giving, but I think the giving is not, it's good, it's great, but it could be much more. Oh, oh, the, yeah. Yeah, there's that a Yeah. Uh, obviously, it's the objective is to be a lighter nation, but today you feel like the nations are, are rejecting Israel. And, and fighting for existence. Like Actually, what I hear from Netanyahu is that all the nations uh, admire Israel. They, they all. Go, uh, if you go to, if, I'm it depends which nation. Maybe, but if you go down to the grassroots of the university, the United States, the America, and the UK, uh, there's a very they much like anti-Israel anti feeling, and, and, and I, I just seem to go right. to, go, go to, I do believe that this is, a, is Israel, and the people are becoming uh, giving, very much giving. It's right. Just, it's, but you know, there's a there's a statement that says uh, a little bit of light drives away a lot of darkness. So if we will work on ourselves and become uh, more 
luminous, so I think uh, all this darkness will fade away. But the Rebbe Shem, it will... Uh, the piano. <coughs> also, in a way, for all these people who are... Uh, all these, you know, like you said, the youngsters in the universities, like those sorts of environments, that they are very anti israel especially in Europe and in the U.S. Uh, it might be an issue of, it says something about them, that they are against Israel. Right. And maybe there's a judgment issue there. Of course, the yeah. problem is that they don't know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says a lot about them, but yeah. they don't know. They because think that they're right. We all know that everything, <coughs> as currently, everything is not perfect. So maybe the fact that Israel stands righteous as an example and others reject it, it's, it's actually meant to be. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, could be. <coughs> Ah, so good that you reminded me. This uh, actually Rav Kook <coughs> related to, uh, referred to Herzl. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. Ah, it says Rav Kook uh, spoke about Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David, and uh, he actually writes. He's asking, what are these two messiahs? Why, why do we need two Mash Mashiach? So he explains that Yosef was the one who sustained the Jews when they were in Egypt. Yosef takes care about the physical needs. And he says that uh, so too will be the redemption. The re redemption of the Jewish people will come in two stages. The first stage is the stage of Mashiach ben Yosef. And he kind of compared Herzl to that. I'm not sure if he meant to say that Herzl as a person himself was Mashiach ben Yosef, or his uh, vision or his idea was reflected by Mashiach ben Yosef. And that's the first stage of the physical redemption of the Jews, which, as I said, I think is Baruch Hashem fulfilled. Now, every Jew in the world can become a citizen of Israel and have a safe place to live, a great state. What could be better than that? Who, uh, what Jew, Jews wouldn't even dream about this uh, so many decades ago. So this, I think, is uh, basically, there's no, there's no threat to the very existence of the state of Israel, they say now, even though Iran is trying to threaten Israel, but uh, they cannot uh, annihilate the state. So, uh, and it says the second stage will be Mashiach ben David, which will come to redeem us spiritually. And that's what uh, we should anticipate uh, soon. Yeah. You mentioned the Ramban on the Torah, the Well, uh, not always something which is the most important is uh, mentioned so many times. It, sometimes it does. But for example, you can ask, uh, if so, how come in a person's body the heart is essential? How come it's only that, that big? The entire body has uh, many more uh, limbs. Or the brain is not great, bigger than that. So actually the mitzvah to be holy, the Torah mentioned more than one. It says in Parashat Tzitzit, V'yitem Kedoshim Lelopichem, it says in a few places to be holy. Right. But, uh, but it is uh, something, uh, as the Ramban says, without this, all the rest of the mitzvot could be, could be meaningless without this mitzvah. That's what he says. So I guess that's something about not wasting any letter or any one mitzvah. Right. Similarly, uh, Rav Kook says, for example, that uh, <coughs> he was asked, what, what should a person learn during the day? So he says that most of the time one should dedicate to learn uh, Gemara, Halakha, and even though certain things are very basic, very fundamental, like studying uh, the basics of Judaism, the Machshava, uh, the uh, Jewish thought, Emunah, but he says it says it shouldn't take up most of your time, even though it's the most more basic, more fundamental, but the time you dedicate to it could be more quality, but less, uh, less in uh, quantity. So, uh, so to hear this mitzvah is uh, in its quality, it's uh, against all other mitzvahs, but uh, it's one mitzvah. So, uh, I hope we'll have uh, we'll have it fulfilled. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <coughs> well, thanks, Rabbi. <laughs>
Jump up.